The following episode of Ear Hustle contains language that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Discretion is advised. Well done, Nige. Well done. <laughs> A little rusty, uh, but we'll get there. You did your shit. We are really happy to be back with a brand new season for you all. But before we get to that, we're going to start the same way we've started a bunch of episodes over the past year. With a quick update on the COVID pandemic in California prisons. As we record this on February 22nd, 210 people incarcerated in California state prisons have died of COVID-19. And Erlon, this shocked me. Over half of the total incarcerated population has had COVID. Mm. There are over 850 active cases, which is bad, but way down from the peak two months ago where there were over 10,000 active cases in the prisons. And some positive news. The vaccine is getting inside. Close to 36,000 incarcerated people have received their first shot, Ooh. plus around 25,000 staff. Indeed. What up, son? And how you been? I'm, I'm alive, man. I'm still doing good for a dude in prison. You know hey, I mean? yes. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. It's good to hear your voice. Good to hear yours as well. We asked our guy inside, our colleague, Rasan New York Thomas, what he was seeing in San Quentin. He said older guys in there... They were lining up to get their vaccine, including our friend Al King. Al King, that's the chef right there. Chef Al King, he cooked up some good shit. Yep, and he was in our episode. The Great Cook-Off. Yep, and New York told us that Al King was psyched to get that vaccine. Oh, Al King was super excited to get the vaccine. He showed up on my gate doing the the vaccine dance, and he was singing. He was in my... He was on my gay singers. <laughs> got my shot, baby. I'm good now. I'm good to go. But New York also says there's a fair number of people who are wary of the vaccine. They don't trust it. They think mm-hmm. they think it's a Tuskegee experiment, uh, the medical history of California prisons. Uh, but I'm like Chris Rock, man. If, if the rich people are taking it, it's probably cool. <laughs> the rich people are definitely taking it, man. You know what I mean? They're probably paying yeah. extra to get it. <laughs> are you going to take it? Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely going to take it. Um, my son is fine, and uh, if I don't take it, are we ever going to get back to normal? Guys are still spending a ton of time in their cells. New York says he gets out for about 90 minutes every couple of days. Other than that, he's in his cell reading, writing, and working out. But last time we talked to you, didn't, say, didn't you say you were like really working on your abs? Yeah, they won't come. I'm trying. I'm doing this damn stuff every day, and nothing's happening. <laughs> bruh, bruh, thanks, bruh. It just, ain't, it just ain't me, huh? I think it's when we get to a certain age, bruh. Things are slowly, slowly opening up in there. Yep. It looks like we'll be hearing more from New York this season, and definitely glad to have them back. Absolutely. And in the meantime, let's get into the season, which starts off with a piece of mystery tape our producer dug up to play for us that we hadn't heard in like a long, long time. Long time. I did not realize that. I could be potentially facing life in prison. Now I'm going to drag you through four corners of this cell. It's like that. It's like, I don't want to be in prison, but I want to know what it's like to be in prison. You really think people want to know what it's like in prison? Hell Hell yeah, of course. You got all these TV shows, new programs, like uh, Prison Break. Orange is the new black, locked up. You won't let me out. You know all the shows. But they all bullshit, though. Why? Why are they bullshit? Is it ain't none of them serving time. They ain't never did no real time. They acting. Yeah, and in prison ain't really like that. No, I man, we just living life. Like everybody else. Oh my God, Erlon, we sound so young. We sound so naive, so ready for whatever's coming our way. <laughs> it's delightful. Uh, delightful. I'm sitting there like, I remember <laughs> that. I sounded about the same. No, you have this like sort of sweet, like naivete to your voice what you saying that disappeared it's not <laughs> sweet anymore it's bitter now it's just... you're all jaded now man <laughs> it's like we had no idea what was coming our way anything was possible 
Yeah. It's a classic. You know, it also um, signifies that I really appreciate about Ear Hustle Aye. is that we're always going to be laughing. Yeah. And I know a lot of people be like, they don't laugh like that in prison. Shit if they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. They laugh like everybody else laugh. Mm. It's funny moments and everything every day. So how many years ago was that? It feels like that was a decade ago. It had to be 2016. It was from that little promo we sent Radiotopia back when we were trying to pitch them on the idea of picking up our prison-generated podcast. Exactly. Before Ear Hustle was even Ear Hustle. Right. And now we've done six seasons, and Erlon, we are on our seventh. Six seasons, Nige. Mm -hmm. We've heard a lot of stories from a lot of people over that time. Oh, yeah. And you know that we hear from listeners all the time asking us, what happened to those people? What are they doing now? What has gone on in their lives since that story aired? So today, we're going to hear from three of them. And there are so many people we could have spoken to. Right. But these three guys seem like the perfect pick because they were really at a crossroad in their lives when they were first on the show. Mm -hmm. And so... We want to know what happened to them since we last put that microphone in front of their faces. I'm Erlon Woods. And I'm Nigel Poor. This is Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. Season seven. All right, here we go. For this first update, we're going way back to the third Ear Hustle episode ever. This one dropped in July of 2017. It was called Looking Out, and it featured a guy who used to surround himself with a whole lot of little friends inside. Gophers, rabbits, I had four swallows, a toad, praying mantis, 21 snails, frog, red-breasted finch, his arm broke, pigeons, I had a desert mold that was- Old Roachy, man. <laughs> it's Roach. My name is Renell Draper, but I go by Roach. My relationship with people is pretty strained. I don't trust them. From early on, they, they have been a source of pain for me. When I was a child, before I was removed from the care of my mom's custody, she tried to drown me a couple times in the tub. And then she stopped and she left the bathroom and she was crying. I, I knew she was unhappy or sad at something I did. I wanted to actually comfort her but I, I didn't know how to do it. I don't remember her face, and I haven't seen her since. Erlon, I've heard that tape I don't know how many times, and it always has the same effect. I mean, it is a tough thing to hear. Yeah, it's a trip, you know, and a lot of individuals have a fucked up beginning, you know? Yeah. And I mean, clearly he was dealing with some heavy stuff. But here's the thing about Roach. Mm. He can also be really funny and lighthearted. And, you know, whenever I would see him at San Quentin, he would always want to stop and chat and give me an update <laughs> on what was going on in his life. Like always. Right. Roach says after that episode aired, he got hundreds of letters from listeners. And one letter from a listener in Kansas led to something a little more than just a pen pal. I was hanging out in the cell one day and I got a letter from somebody. And the first line was like, they heard me on Ear Hustle podcast. And they said, felt like they had met me before, they didn't know me. And they felt a connection. They built some sort of a relationship. That person even came out here from Kansas. What was that like? Yeah. That's very odd. This was his first visit in 22 years. Th take that in. 22 years without a visit. And that's aside from like lawyer visits and stuff like that. Yeah, right. It was his first personal visit. Yeah, it was like a personal, personal visit. Mm -hmm. How did you prepare for the visit? Uh, stress. Um, I didn't do anything really. The second day, I did shave to get two different ways I could look because I could look more presentable when I shave. Were you excited? Were you nervous? Were you angry? Anxious? I was really nervous because the interaction was hard because I'm not used to the interaction. It was weird for me. It was weird <laughs> as hell. It was odd because 
this is the first time you meet this person, and and then I gave this person a kiss. I was like, I was a little nervous, you know. Kissing to me is stupid because I don't know. I haven't done it in a thousand years. Why is kissing stupid? I guess the level of intimacy. It's so close. It's so close that it's like somebody's inside your face, really. I don't know, it's like expectations are on top on there. Yeah. I, I kiss somebody in the tree is supposed to grow. Like he kissed somebody in a tree supposed to grow? <laughs> I don't know. All I can say is that is classic Roach. <laughs> Indeed. And after the kiss, Roach fell in deep. And it was really crazy because experiencing it, it hurt all up in the body. That strong feeling of somebody loving me that way. The way I was taking it, it just hurt even when it felt good. It hurt. Oh my gosh. I'm like, why do people want to fall in love? That's crazy. Okay, E, I know you weren't inside then, but I remember seeing Roach in the yard around that time and something had really changed in him. He was like this little giddy teenager. He was happy and skipping and like tra la lying around. It was like he was floating on a cloud. His whole body language was different. He was like a different guy. Mm. But then one day I saw him and he was so angry. It was like this dark storm cloud was all around him. And all of that joy and love that he had felt had just fallen apart. And he was devastated. Right. And when I went back in to San Quentin with you that time, mm-hmm. and I seen him, he was crushed. Yep. I'm like, what's happening with you? He's like, man, she broke up with me. And I'm like, huh? It sounds like she told him that it was just too hard to date someone in prison. Mm -hmm. That's how he made it sound. Yeah, yeah. How did you react? What did you do with the heartache? I cried. I cut people out. I cut the hair off. It was too far. I just cut it off. I just took the razor and just cut them off. They're all, they're gone. I ended up cutting it off with a razor, then I ended up giving it to people. And those dreadlocks, Erlon, you know they were a really important part of who Roach was. Hell yeah, they was. We talked about it in the episode. Yes. He put different oils on each one of them, and he'd sit there smelling each one of them. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And those dreadlocks is what made him Jesus Christ. I mean, that was like a huge statement. It was his way of saying something's really wrong. I remember I saw you when you cut your hair. It was pretty shocking. I mean, it seemed, and you did it, I mean, as an observer, it looked like it was done out of anger. I mean, it was like. Uneven. Like, yeah, like it was snatched off your head. It was anger. It was anger to make a point. So many things were happening at the time in my head. I was unhappy. So where do you put your affections if you don't have a relationship? Where does that need for love and affection go? It doesn't go that deep anymore. I mean, I don't lose myself with somebody else anymore. I still got the animals. How many critters do you have now? I have sugar butt and two snugs who grow really fast. And three centipedes. And I had one worm. Now it's like, I don't know how many. Every time I move the dirt around, it's a thousand worms jumping up at me. But... That's pretty much it. And let me say this. In prison, when you call somebody sugar butt, I think you need to clarify that, bruh. Man, I'm Roach. It don't even matter. Sugar butt's a snail. Sugar butt's Is it fair to say that's where your love goes to the little critters? Always. I mean, that just goes, that's got to, I mean, that's it. Shoot. I mean, they, that just goes without saying. Because they don't even know. I'm, I'm going to say a name. Tell me the first thing that come in your head. Uh, Michelle Barone. Ah, Michelle. Mm. Michelle cheated off me in English class in high school. So somebody I went to high school with. There's a lot of uh, history there. (laughs) I met Ronell in 10th grade English. Ronell tells a story that I used to cheat off of him in poetry or some crap. 
This is, of course, Michelle, Roach's friend from growing up. The first time I saw Renell, he was wearing pink biker pants. Hot pink. When I say pink, I mean hot, hot pink. And like those colorful Mark and Mindy rainbow suspenders. That's how he used to come to school. He was just very different than everybody else. And he knew it and everybody else knew it. Michelle is not into the nickname Roach. I will not call him that. Nope. (laughs) She calls him Ronell. This kind of blew my mind, Erlon. After the episode aired, we got an email from Michelle about Roach, a.k.a. Ronell. In that episode, we had talked about how he lived up in the rafters of someone's house. Those were Michelle's rafters. Do you remember him keeping any pets back then? I don't remember him keeping anything, but we had, I always had dogs and cats. We had a cat that loved Ronell. <laughs> he swore that the cat said his name. Um, <laughs> the cat was in heat rubbing up on his leg and meowing, but he swore the cat was saying his name. <laughs> So his meow was Ronell. Ronell, it could be he swore, he swore it was saying Ronell. <laughs> you know he went to school for cosmetology. No. Oh. Yes, we went. We both went to the Votech school. I went for the nursing program, and he went to the Votech school for cosmetology. He could do some hair. I'm a little speechless. Sorry, I'm not even sure how to react to that. <laughs> yes, he did. He went for cosmetology. But yeah. I used to go get him because I was in the nursing program. I used to go get him out of class to do EKGs on him when we were learning EKGs because I wanted to see his chest. That's just being honest. Uh, and, uh-huh. how, and how was that chest? <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Did you have a romance with him or were you friends? We were friends, but I always had a crush on him. Mm-hmm. I always loved me some Rennell. You know, when Rennell gets out of jail, he always has a place to go. I've been married. I've been divorced. I've been around the block, but my heart's always been with Rennell. Do you Do you imagine some future with him? Um, if he gets out, yeah. The day after we talked to her, Michelle had her first video visit with Roach. It was the first time she's seen his face in 25 years. Yeah, except she didn't really get to see his face because of COVID, he was wearing a mask. So, I don't know, man, Erlon, I really hope the next time they see each other, they actually, um, you know... Really, really get to see each other. Exactly. Okay. The next person we're going to check in with was on an episode back in season four. And Erlon, remind me, (laughs) wasn't there something kind of special about that season? Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a lot special shit. (laughs) Tell me about it. Season four was my first season as an outside co-host. My first season not living in San Quentin. And it was so great. The first story I did from the outside was called Kissing the Concrete. We followed two guys as they got out of San Quentin. You in New York, y'all interviewed them right before they stepped out of the gate. Yep. And I met them on the other side of those gates. Exactly. Here's a bit with one of those guys, Ronnie Young, the day before he got out. What are the three things that you're looking forward to the most after you get out? Okay, three things I'm looking forward to. Showering alone. <laughs> oh my God, that's so huge. <laughs> Um, being able to open a refrigerator door and grab a pickle or something to drink <laughs> ice cream and then I gotta have milk on ice cream <laughs> what flavor? <laughs> oh god it doesn't even matter to me I, I, I just love ice cream so what are you? What are your concerns? Think, I mean, I, when, when we asked you what's happening tomorrow, I could see your face got really excited, but I can also see there's a part of you that's wearing something heavy. 
because I don't know what I'm going to do. How old were you the first time you came to prison? Oh, 22. And how old are you now? Uh, I'm 50. So I'm going to just ask you a blatant question. Why do you keep coming back to prison? Drugs. Every time I get out of prison, I go right back to selling drugs and using drugs. And what's your drug of choice? Methamphetamine. So where are you with your addiction right now? I don't know. You don't know. Yeah. I want to say uh, it's behind me, but it's not. I mean, it's right in my face. Erlon, that tape brings me right back to that conversation. And, you know, we talk to a lot of guys who are just about to get out, and it's such a vulnerable moment. There's so much hope and expectation, and you really don't know how it's going to go for them. Nah, you have it in your mind, but then when you get out, it's, it's reality. Mm-hmm. So I end up meeting Ronnie at the gate. How you doing, man? Good, you? I'm chilling, man. I'm kicking back. I got you. I feel. I got you. They're not on your Wonderful. Then he headed a couple hours east to the county he paroled to. And we were going to stay in touch with him, but it just didn't work out that way. Nah, he stopped answering my calls. By the time I caught up with him, he was back using. I've stayed in touch with him on and off over the past two years and reached out again recently to see where he was at in life. And we'll get to that right after a quick break. This is a prepaid collect call from Ronnie. An inmate at Calaveras County Sheriff's Office. Hey, Ronnie. (laughs) Nigel. Hello. How are you? Good, man. It's been so long since I talked to you. I know, huh? Yeah. It's been a while. As listeners can probably tell, Ronnie is locked up again. Which is why every time we talked to him, we had to wait through this absurd series of automated prompts and messages from that goddamn phone system. (laughs) It drove me nuts. Thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Hey, bro, I got to go through an act of Congress to get you on the call. That's crazy. It's like two minutes long. (laughs) Like, press this, press that. Ronnie, are you just sitting there waiting? Like, when are they going to pick up? This is taking forever. Uh, yeah, it goes through a little thing saying, wait while your party's entering information to accept the call. It's what? Ronnie has been back in jail for about a year. He got picked up after cops tried to pull him over and he bolted. And now he's back in prison with a three-year sentence. And so, why, can I ask you, like, why did you run? Um, I just got scared and, and, and I had a uh, crank in my pocket and, and I was just uh, spooked and, and, and ran from them. And, and, you, and it's crazy because if I would have pulled over, um, it, it probably wouldn't have been so bad. I, I think I, I I wasn't I wasn't doing everything I should have been doing for one. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I was still I was still messing around, and and you know, and I had I had some you know some people in my corner helping me, and. And, and and I screwed that up. What, what if someone said to you, Ronnie, I'm going to do anything you need. Just tell me, what is it? What can I do to help you change this? What would you say to them? What would you ask for? Oh, God. Um... <laughs> You know, uh, um, (laughs) I 
don't know. Now, um, you have one minute left. Uh, figures. Um, Will you think about that when we talk to you next time? Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. Do, All right. You, do you have any um, specific time? Because I know uh, that you can call tomorrow. Yeah, give us a time, Ronnie. Um, um, so I'll probably have this by 9 o'clock, but then they Thank shut them off. Using secure. Oh. Goodbye. Oh, God <laughs> damn it. Motherfucker. I hate this. I know, it makes you laugh for a lot. Um, <laughs> The next time we got Ronnie on the phone, I asked him about some of the good things that had happened to him in the brief time that he was out. So some of the best moments I had out there, I, I want to say, were with my grandson. Yeah, going to the movies with my grandson, just hanging out with him, looking out my, my bedroom window first thing in the morning when the sun's starting to come up. And there's a deer right outside my bedroom window, and and I have a I have a really nice bike, you know, one that you pedal, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I love it. And I would just ride everywhere and and look at the deer and and look at the wildlife. Um, it's beautiful up here. Your other question, I. I God, I, I don't know what to say about that. I just don't know. I mean, what someone could do to help me change. I, I, I think, you know, my mom is getting up in age and, and she's been having a hard time here lately. And and who knows, maybe that might be a good thing for me to go back and take care of her. You know, when when my kids were alive and I would get out and I had good intentions of, of doing the right things and taking care of my children, and then I never did, you know. You have one minute left. <laughs> But, uh, um, so do that, you want to call back one more time after this? Sure, absolutely. So maybe when we get back on. Thank you for using <laughs> Securus. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Ronnie, what could you do for yourself? Because I know a lot of people say, well, really, you can only help yourself. And I'm asking you what other people could do for you. But what could what could you do for yourself to change things? I think if I or to stay busy mm -hmm. and for sure stay away from methamphetamine. Um, yeah. Can, is it possible to describe what it's like to constantly be driven back to it? Because you always have good intentions. Every time we talk to you, you got great intentions. I don't, I don't know how, I don't know. I don't even know how to answer your questions. Um, yeah. Do you remember the first time that you did it? Ooh. Um, yeah, I was probably... God. I was probably like 12 or 13 years old. When you're doing it, do you at the moment do you feel better? Is there like a momentary part where you're like, okay, I, I feel all right now? Yeah, maybe, um, maybe at first, but um, hey, man, what you doing? Huh? What you over there doing? All I hear is. <laughs> You know, a weird noise. Oh, that's, uh, I guess that's my, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm squeezing the tablet. Oh. You guys oh, hear that, huh? And why are you over there trying to break the tablet? Oh, oh no. <laughs> are we making you nervous? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> There's this little rubber, um, 
Grab it around the tablet, and I'm squeezing it. <laughs> you have one minute left. Well, you have All a right. you have a Thanks good it. night, bro, and hold on, man, and keep your head up. Yeah, thank All right, you. thank um, you. It's good to talk to you. Good talking to you too, Nigel. All right, thank you. Okay, take, take, take care. Okay, okay. Thank okay, you for using Securus. Goodbye. I'm going to keep checking in with Ronnie, as long as he continue to keep calling me. Well, you know he'll keep calling you. Yeah, it's all good. I hope so. I hope he do. I hope he do. The crime I committed was I walked into a liquor store. I snatched two $20 bills out of the cash register. I pled guilty to burglary, robbery, and they gave me 50 years to life. Currently, I'm on my 23rd year. The first time I'm eligible for parole is 2044. Curtis Roberts appeared on our show back at the end of our first season in an episode called Left Behind. Curtis was sentenced under California Three Strikes Law. 50 years to life for stealing $40. That's fucked up. Real talk. Oh, God, Erlon. I think that sentence is one of the reasons Curtis's story really stuck with us and with a lot of listeners. In that episode, Curtis talked about how his crime and the sentence he received had really devastated his relationship with his family. My wife divorced me the same week I got the 50 years. We made an agreement, my pleading guilty, she was going to get the house. Uh, she got 100% care of, of our child and, um, and all the money we had in our savings account. And in exchange, I was going to be able to see my daughter for at least once a year, no matter where I was. Well, next thing I know, our house was sold and she has vanished. Here I am on my 23rd year and I haven't seen my daughter yet. By the end of that episode, the two of them were starting to talk, but it was still pretty rocky. Then, a year after that story aired, Curtis got some good news. California Governor Jerry Brown commuted his sentence, which was originally going to keep him in prison until 2044. Instead, he got out of prison at the end of 2018. One month after I did. Yep. We checked in on Curtis a few times since he got out of prison. And E, it was clear from the start that Curtis was really focused on building his relationship back up with his daughter. Yep. I remember that first time we saw him. It was just a couple of months after he'd gotten out. And I asked him how things were going with her. And he got this big ass smile on his face and pulled his phone out. So he's scrolling. So that mean they they've been having some live <laughs> interactions. Wait, let me show you one of the the latest pictures she sent me. I just got that just like two days ago. Okay. From her. And them your grandkids? Yeah, those are my grandkids. Curtis's daughter Christiana lives in another state, but they'd been having a gang of back and forths, and they talked about some real shit. So she asked me the question, and it was. Dad, was I that bad of a little girl that you had to use drugs? Whew. I thought, how sad that um, she's carried for 25 years that question that, am I that bad that my dad has to run off and use drugs? And I, I am really glad that I was there to answer it and let her know. Why you just never hit the button to call? There's a button on there where you can call. Because There's a button on there you can FaceTime. I want to... See, what? there you go with that FaceTime stuff. I want to... Um, I want to honor her. I don't want to chase her away. That conversation was a couple years ago. It's about time for an update. So, not long ago, we met up with Curtis outside his apartment building just north of San Francisco. Right. And we're still doing all of our interviews outside because of freaking COVID. And, Erlon, it was so windy that day because, you know, it's Northern yeah. California. And for an audio person, you're like, ah, this is going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, that is why you hear that rustling in the background. We asked him how things were going with his daughter. Um... We text. Uh, I think we spoke on the phone twice. Sometimes it takes a while for her to respond to my texts. 
But maybe that's a safe way to be in touch. It doesn't require too much, but you can also still show up. I think so. Yeah. Erlon, it seems like there's still clearly some distance between him and his daughter. Yes. You know, sometimes you got to think she was five years old. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's a long time to mend that relationship because he's like a stranger in a way. I know. I know. It's tough. But something had changed in the way he talked about his daughter. He's speaking up for himself more and letting her know what he wants from their relationship. Finally, I just, I wrote her a letter and I said, you know, this does, this is not working for me. I said, I was closer to you when I was in prison. I said, I'm out here. I said, you don't care to have nothing to do with me. I said, if we're going to be father, daughter, or in a relationship, then let's do it. If not, then fine. Let me know. And it, man, it sh- I think it shocked her into, wow, he's willing to fight for this. And she responded. What was the response? She started opening up and telling me about her life, tell me about her husband, tell me about the kids, um, tell me about her mother, which is, you know, a huge issue. Yeah. Um, And then, but things fell apart, or? Her, you know, life showed up on her end. Yeah, I mean, she has three kids to take care of, and she's a single mom now. So did you ever see her? Have you seen, no. Oh, it's been 27 years. Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen there? I don't know. I I think um, in time, just give her time. Mm-hmm. You know, she's learning lots about me still. Yeah. There was something else we wanted to talk to Curtis about. His love life. Oh, yeah. Listeners might remember that in season four, we told you about how when Curtis got out of prison, he was very eager to start dating, but a little uncertain about how it was supposed to work. I remember the time he told us about that woman who dropped off the box at his house and he helped her carry the boxes. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And so the girl jumped off the back of the truck just to give me a hug for helping them. And man, I talked about that hug for three days. <laughs> Cause she didn't hug nobody else, but she hugged me. And I thought it meant something, you know, but I guess it was just a hug. <laughs> okay, Erlon, I think you're right. Clueless. That's Curtis. <laughs> so Curtis went from being clueless about dating to being married. And so, Laura and Curtis have openly declared in a space of their wish to be united a few before months. these witnesses. Therefore, now they have become husband and wife. Wow. Yay. You make this and Nige, you had some doubts about this wedding. Yeah, okay, I did. Um, you know, what can I say? He, he, it seems so rushed. Like, what was the hurry? And I was just, you know, I was a bit worried about it. Well, it's been nearly two years since that wedding. And we've got an update. What has been the most uh, delightful thing that has happened to you since you got out of prison? Getting married. Getting married. I didn't realize what a, a gift Laura really is. You know, you get a gift and you don't really realize how awesome the gift is until maybe somewhere down the road. Mm -hmm. That's Laura. Amazing gift. Wow. Yeah. Curtis and Laura are still happily married. They live in this nice apartment complex with a swimming pool and beautiful landscaping. And Erlon, as you know, they have a cat and three dogs. And not long ago, the two of them flew back to Chicago to spend some time with Laura's kids. I got to see Laura as a mom, and I got to see a mother's heart. And it was a love that I I never knew. Man, that that girl loves her kids. And I remember the last day we were there, um, one of her kids, she just wrapped her arms around Laura and wouldn't let go. Man, it just bursted me into tears. How, How did it make you think about your own relationship with your mom? 
it was twofold because I was really happy to learn this about Laura, but it was really sad to realize that I never knew that type yeah. of love. Yeah. Is your mother still alive? I have no idea. You have, you have no contact with her? Uh uh-uh. uh. I haven't spoken to her since probably the early 80s. And my dad was before that. So, some of Curtis's relationships are definitely not where he wants them to be. But in general, I think he's in a better place. Oh, definitely. It's so clear to me, Erlon. Emotionally, he just like takes up more space. And it's really interesting. He just projects out into the world in this very different way. Well, I mean, he's speaking up for himself now. You know, he's confident yep. in that part, I think. So. Definitely. Even the way he looked seemed kind of different. Well, I have to say, you look a lot less boyish than you did when you were inside prison. You always were very youthful, but you seem like you take up a little more space now, which that's a good thing. Yeah, I think because I'm, I'm finding myself. Yeah. I'm more stable in there. Man, I took so much, and I had Sally's just beat the hell out of me. Yeah. And I'm not saying physically. I mean, that did happen, but it was emotionally and just constant and I just became smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller yeah. inside the prison and it was it took its toll. Part of what Curtis is talking about there is something that came up in the first episode with him. He was raped while he was in prison. And he told us that he still struggles with the trauma that caused. Um, what was it like the first time you jumped into this pool? First time I swam in geez, decades. <laughs> well, it was actually pretty nerve-wracking because why? to go underwater, and you know, I still don't trust my surroundings. So it was hard to close my eyes and, yeah, the trauma from prison. And I discovered being out here that while I was in prison, I didn't get to heal properly. You don't have a chance. You know, you got to face the day and lockdowns and all that stuff. And you learn that when you're out here. Um, and the fact is, it still comes. You yeah. know, you still go to those dark places. Laura now sees it in me. And, and you know what Laura will say? Curtis, use your voice. Use your voice. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Uh, it is now time for Curtis to come with his exposition on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Recently, Curtis found a new form for that voice he's finding. Back at the same church he got married at. That's right. He started preaching there, and soon he and Laura are going to be moving into a house on his property, and Curtis is going to take on a bigger role in the church. And today, I'm going to speak to you guys. A few Sundays ago, there he was, standing in front of the congregation, giving a talk. So we know this is a letter from Paul. Um, the Apostle Paul and I have something in common. And that is, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter from prison. And though I didn't write no letters, I was incarcerated like he. So I understand a little bit about how God deals with the incarcerated, as Paul does. It is really nice to see Curtis out, building a new life, and just smiling a lot. Right. He's one of a bunch of folks who we first talked to inside San Quentin, and now we get to hang out with him on the streets in this free world. Mm-hmm. Including, of course, our colleagues Yaya and Antoine. Exactly. And do you remember that time you, me, and Antoine were out having dinner, and we ran into AR from season one? Remember right. him? Yeah. AR yep. and Drew? Uh, from Unwritten, yep. Exactly. And he was just out there celebrating a birthday with his wife, and we all got to sit down and enjoy dinner together. Right. We see Maserati E. Mm-hmm. I also see, like, Gator, Sha. Dante, and guys out here doing hella good. Erlon, it's wonderful, and it makes me so happy. Right. But there are definitely some people like Ronnie, too. Folks who struggle to get free and stay free. Definitely. And there's also plenty of people like Roach, still inside, trying to build a life. Yeah, there are. Erlon, I have to say, I'm really excited to be back. Hell yeah, season seven. Yeah, looking forward to it.
Thanks to Tammy for her help with this episode. Air Hustle is produced by Nigel Four, Erlon Woods, Rasan New York Thomas, John Yaya Johnson, and Bruce Wallace. This episode was sound designed and engineered by Antoine Williams with music by Antoine and David Saucy. Amy Standen edits the show. Shubnam Sigmund is our digital producer and Julie Shapiro is the executive producer for Radiotopia. Ear Hustle would like to thank acting warden Ron Broomfield, and as you know, every episode of Ear Hustle has to be approved by this guy here. This is Lieutenant Sam Robinson, the public information officer at San Quentin State Prison. I listened to this episode. It's nice to hear uh, from the guys again and, and catching up with those who are no longer here, even though, you know, there are challenges, and that's what incarceration is about. It's more than just engaging a guy on the day that you know, you engage with them. There's a, it's a life story. There's, there's baggage. There's everything else that's surrounding the individual. And that's, I guess, that's one of the reasons I do appreciate Ear Hustle because it invites the world in to listen to just the complexities of incarceration. So with that, I know it was long, uh, but it's the beginning of a new season. It's been a while since I've had the opportunity to speak. So with that, I will say I approve this episode. This podcast was made possible with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, working to redesign the justice system by building power and opportunity for communities impacted by incarceration. Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collection of the best podcasts around. Hear more at radiotopia.fm. I'm Nigel Poor. And I'm Erlon Woods. Peace. Thank you for using Securus. Goodbye. Radio Tokyo.